Warning, the following video contains explicit language which may be offensive to some viewers or inappropriate for children. The content within this video is intended for mature audiences only. Hello and salutations to everybody. Hope your life is going good. Um, we are starting Rabbits Season 1, Episode 10, the final episode of this um, first season uh, titled The Future We Deserve. So, let's get into it and see what we got. Hearing Yumiko's voice on the message was shocking, and it changed the tone of my investigation from one of urgency due to Jones's implied ticking clock of multidimensional weirdness to a much more visceral and physical immediacy. Now, Jones's ticking clock of multidimensional madness. Um, Sounds like something that would have come out of, like, classic, you know, early 20th century science fiction or something. But, you know, I just, I love that particular ordering of words. Just the way, the that callback to kind of, you know, the Jules Verne era of science fiction. Or even Lovecraft. I mean, that's more of a Lovecraftian title, but, you know, it's, it's interesting. Yumiko was in trouble, and I needed to find her. At no point did I actually believe my friend had taken off to India or somewhere to find herself without letting anyone know. But before hearing her voice on that recording, something like that had remained a distant possibility. Now it was clear. She was, or had been, in very real and immediate danger. About 10 seconds after I'd listened to Yumiko's message for the first time, I heard something outside my apartment building. I made my way over to the window and looked down at the street. Standing in the middle of the road were two figures, dressed in gray. And what would cause the men in gray to want to watch Carly? What, you know, we got to figure out what she's done or or why she why they're watching her and why they're standing in the middle of the street where she could find them and see them why aren't they in some kind of like place where they could observe without being seen i couldn't make out their faces but i could tell they were looking up at my building Right at my window. Right at me. Look, just the kind of weirdo that I am, I would have waved at him. I would have looked at him and waved out the window at him just to say, hey. But, you know, that's just me. I, and I don't think she does anything that, that crazy, but, you know, it's possible. 
I called Jones and told him what was happening. He told me to keep my eye on the people in gray and to stay put. I hung up and did my best to keep looking at the figures. It was strange. I stared at them and they stood there, staring back for a long time. But then they were, or became, inconsistent, kind of fluttering, if that makes any sense. They would start to disappear momentarily, the longer I stared. I would have to turn away and look back sometimes, just to keep them in focus. It could have been the dimly lit street, but it felt... weird. About five minutes after I spoke with Jones, the figure stepped out from the middle of the street and moved toward the front door of my building. Yeah, it makes... That right there tells you, you know, they saw her watching them, so, you know, they've got to do what they've got to do. I pressed record on my voice recorder and sat down with my back to the window, a huge butcher knife in my shaky hands. Now that is straight out of a, a bad 80s horror movie like um, Halloween or Friday the 13th franchise or just about any of your, your really, you know, bad uh, excuses to have young women topless running around. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, that's kind of that, that, you know, young woman with a butcher knife waiting on the killers type feel and waited. It's been a few minutes since they moved toward the front door of my building. I can't hear anything. There's somebody coming up the elevator. See, what makes me wonder, she saw him phasing in and out of our reality. So what makes her think that a butcher knife is going to help her? Unless it's just a primal survival instinct kicking in. I can hear them moving down the hall. They've stopped in the hall outside. See, that gives the whole, gives me the whole Blair Witch feeling. So, yeah, that's just, you know, phasing in and out of reality, talking into a recorder, and all that crazy stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. They're here. I jumped up and opened the door. I'd never been so happy to see another human being in my life. I hugged Jones for too long before I remembered that I wasn't sure if I trusted him or not. After things settled down, we checked around the perimeter of my building. There was nobody there. We came back upstairs and I told Jones what I'd found. I told him about the numbers from that bathroom stall and played him the recording of Yumiko. What do you think? Sounds like Yumiko was worried. That she knew she didn't have much time. Do you think those people outside could have been wardens? I don't know. Maybe. How are you feeling? What? You mean, did I imagine the figures in the street because I'm super stressed out? My friend is missing. I just heard her voice on a strange recording that we found by following a series of insane, impossible clues. And you've been talking nonstop, pretty convincingly, I might add, about the end of the world. 
I don't talk nonstop. Do I? <laughs> they were out there. Two of them. Standing in the street, looking up. Right into my window. I believe you. Could you tell me again exactly what was happening with you and Yumiko? I started helping her play the game. The escort stuff? I had no idea she was going to try and pose as an escort. I would never have allowed that. Well, it's hard to stop Yumiko from doing something once she sets her mind to it. Well, you two have a lot in common. And that's... I kind of think that might be the... The... the the bullheadedness, the you know, pig-headed, that may have attracted Jones to first Yumiko, then to Carly, in more of a brotherly way. I don't think it's a a, a sexual attract attraction or a romantic attraction, but it's a the the thing that of wanting to be around people that are mentally open while being fairly strong mentally. You know, that have the ability to embrace things they don't understand while still having the strength to think clearly through it. What else? She'd uncovered a John connected to a few of the escorts, somebody with a clue to rabbits. The lighthouse. It wasn't clear. It just felt like the next move. What happened after that? You know the rest. Yumiko had been digging into Emily Masterson's death. She was convinced it was Hazel or me. It wasn't long before she found the same photo you did. When she found out I was Hazel, she stopped talking to me. I made contact with you as soon as I found out you were looking into her disappearance. That's it? That's it. And I honestly think at that point Jones put all the cards on the table. Or all of his cards on the table. Jones and I listened to the recording a few more times and made some notes. I opened my laptop to research the text from the message. But before I could look into any of that stuff, I saw the headlines. Alan Scarpio was in the hospital, in critical condition. Sometime late yesterday afternoon, he'd slipped on his pool deck and cracked his head on the cement. Ouch. He was discovered by his housekeeper. He's currently in a medically induced coma. Alan Scarpio was the best source of information I had on Hazel or Jones, or whoever he is. And now Scarpio was out of the picture. Or at least temporarily out of the picture. I called the number I had for the courier, who'd delivered the Defender 2 logic board to Yumiko's gym. The number was out of service. I received a text from Yumiko's brother, Adam, about an hour after Jones arrived at my place. He was meeting with the police for an update on Yumiko. He invited me to join him. I wasn't allowed to record that meeting, but I'll summarize it for you. The police had uncovered security camera footage of Yumiko at the Peace Arch border crossing into Canada. She's sitting in the passenger seat of a silver Saab 900. She turns and stares right into the camera and smiles. Now, the question has to be, is she doing this of her own free will? Or is she being coerced? The reason the border agency flagged the footage is due to the fact that, other than this video footage, they have no record of a woman named Yumiko Takata crossing the border. No record of her passport. Nothing at all. An apparent computer error resulted in the car's occupants being flagged 
as unknown. The only thing they had was the border agent's recollection of the occupants of the car stating their destination as Vancouver Island. Apparently, there was also something wrong with the server that held the driver's side and license plate cameras from that date. The police told us that they had somebody waiting through that footage from their backup servers, and they'd let us know as soon as they had it. They figured, if they could ID the person driving the car, they'd have something to go on. The fact that Yumiko smiled into the camera, however, could indicate that Yumiko knew her captor, or was okay with whoever was driving that car. Or she could have been drugged and was just kind of you know, inebriated and didn't know what was going on around her. The only thing we could think of was maybe she was heading to a lighthouse. Jones and I went through every lighthouse on Vancouver Island, looking for some kind of clue or indicator that might help us narrow things down. There were a whole lot of them, and almost all of them had steps, stairs, or ladders. Nothing stood out as far as the names, or the names in relation to the number 6878. We discussed driving up to Canada, and taking a ferry to Vancouver Island, but we had no idea where to go once we got there. I called my friend Nick, a Canadian, who actually splits his time between Seattle and Vancouver. Carly Parker, what's up? So many things. I've heard. How are you holding up? I'm good. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's just kind of interesting um, that um, Nick Silver, who is a real person, both, I mean, he's a character in this podcast, but... He's actually one of the people that founded uh, Public Radio Alliance. And this blending of real and fantasy and fiction and stuff, it's, it's one of those enduring things um, that just helps with the... Um, the the lore and the immersion into the story hey could you look into something for me i sent you an email a minute ago sure what is it it's a recording from yumiko but there's another voice a male talking about design and architecture okay what is it you're looking for exactly well a name would be great but i'll take anything you can dig up i wasn't able to find anything but i've been a bit uh, busy. Right. Also, apparently Yumiko was spotted at the Canadian border in a Silver Saab 900. They were headed for Vancouver Island. Wow. Okay. Are you sure everything's okay? Yeah. Do you think Yumiko really was working as an escort? And... That's an interesting question. A very thought-provoking question. No way. No. No? No. Good. Call me back if you dig up anything on that recording, okay? Will do. Thanks. Now, his research and stuff is going to be done outside of the the podcast itself but it makes you wonder if you have a studio like that that if you know if they have the equipment and the technology and the 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 human know-how to strip the different layers off the audio and find out, you know, you had, you know, pull off this sound, pull out this, sound, you know, and break it down and pull it apart. I hung up with Nick and sat down to go over everything I had on Yumiko. 
She watched that weird video, took some sexy photos that didn't show her face, posted those pictures online, signed up for an escort review site, went to the Natural History Museum to look at the birds, asked a man in a hotel room how many steps to the lighthouse, took a book out of the library, ended up in that diner writing on the bathroom stall, and drove across the border into Canada, possibly headed toward Vancouver Island somewhere. Yeah, putting all the clues out to rearrange, see how they fit together. Jones told me that Yumiko had stopped talking to him when she found the photo evidence that he was Hazel, sometime before she went to the Natural History Museum. I remembered something as I was rehashing this stuff in my mind. While I was looking for other escorts to contact regarding the John Yumiko had seen in that hotel room, I saw a bunch of escort websites, including a site for Amy X, the escort who led me to the guy to whom Yumiko asked the question, how many steps to the lighthouse? Amy X's photos were almost identical to Yumiko's. The same type of poses, the same type of lighting, even more telling, the same curtains and dresser. I called her and asked about the photographer who'd taken those pictures. Hello? Hey, Amy, it's Carly Parker again. Hey. Hey, I, I called you a while ago about my missing friend. Lissandra. Right, Lissandra. Is she okay? I'm still looking. It's been a while. Yeah. So listen, I noticed some similarities between your photographs and my friends. Similar poses, lighting, framing. It's Loris. Loris? She's the shutterbug, the bellhop at the hotel. At what hotel? The place your friend met, the creepy guy who gave me the shitty review. Loris at the hotel. Yeah. You think he might have taken those photos of Yumiko or Lysandra? Loris takes a lot of the girls' photos. He's not creepy. Doesn't try and trade favors or anything. Great. Thanks a lot. Sure. And I think this is where we'll call this uh, episode good. And the uh, it's interesting. It's starting to bubble up. It started bubbling up in seven and eight. It got a little bit more frothy, then a little bit thicker in nine, and now we're we're getting to the end, slowly but surely. So until next time, hope the holidays treated you well. And until next time, peace. Hey, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are?